Hey, it's Erica. And before we dive into today's podcast episode with Dave Ramsey, which I am so excited for you to listen to, I want to invite you to a one of a kind five day challenge with me starting on November 13th, where I'll be sharing how you, along with thousands of others, can make your first $10,000 with investing. And you may be thinking, Erica, I've never invested before, or I don't have a ton of money lying around. But that's exactly why I created this challenge for you. Because it doesn't matter if you have tens of thousands of dollars to invest or you're starting with next to nothing. You're going to discover easy and fun ways that will allow you to start generating passive income, multiplying your money, and creating a future of financial independence without a lot of the guesswork, complexity, and risk when it comes to investing. But the challenge is right around the corner, so make sure you secure your spot by clicking the link in the description below. And by the way, this is totally free to join, and you'll even have the opportunity to win $1,000 cash. All you need to do is click the link below in the description or go to erica.com invest, and you can secure your spot. And I can't wait to see you on November 13th. Now, let's jump into today's episode. Apparently, this is controversial. I felt so inept. I felt so incomplete. I was such a bad husband. Money is the biggest cause of divorce. Dave Ramsey, Ramsey Solutions founder, national best-selling author. Dave Ramsey's a personal finance expert, author of the book, Baby Steps Millionaires. We started with nothing. Made a lot of money from starting from nothing. We had $4 million, a million dollar net worth by the time I was 26, but... 10 years ago, if you would have asked me if I would become a millionaire, I would say no. At 28 years old, at the bottom of that was bankrupt. More debt equals more risk. What was it that you believed about money at 25 that you now know is completely wrong? I'm Erica Kohlberg, and you're listening to the Erica Taught Me podcast. Was there any specific event that really defined the way you think about money now? Oh, absolutely. We went broke. We started with nothing, Sharon and I, my wife and I, and came out of college. I had a degree in finance and was uh, a real estate person. And so I Bought and sold real estate, made a lot of money from starting from nothing. We had $4 million and a million dollar net worth by the time I was 26, but I'd borrowed too much money. So we spent the next two and a half years of our life losing everything we owned. And uh, at 28 years old, at the bottom of that was bankrupt and got the opportunity to start over. I'm kind of a, a utilitarian, pragmatist type character. And so that didn't work. So we got to find out what does work. So apparently what I've been taught you know, I either didn't understand it, I was dumb, or it was wrong. And so I went on this quest talking to what we would call best practices in the business world, right? We talking to old people that were rich, not young people. I'd been young and rich. I didn't want his opinion. So when we hit bottom and we're bankrupt at 28 years old with a brand new baby, a toddler, and a marriage hanging on by a thread, I decided I was going to talk to old rich people and do best practices and find out how people got money and kept it because obviously I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and so we always laugh and say, I got a PhD in DUMB. And uh, man, it was a painful process. And so um, I discovered common sense. And I'm a person of faith, and I was a baby. I was in that journey. And so I found out that these guys were saying that the Bible had something to say about money, which was weird to me, because I didn't grow up with that stuff. And like that's strange. But then when I studied those concepts, they were the same concepts I was finding from the old people, and it's called common sense. You know, live on less than you make, get out of debt, stay out of debt. Um, you know, these basic ideas, have a plan, have a budget, you know, have, and things that you would think I would have known with a finance degree, but no, I didn't. I, I didn't know anything. So the, the crucible of pain going through that two and a half years of hell formed really solid uh, beliefs in this stuff and now living it for 30 plus years since then uh, and the proof in, in our personal lives as well as all the other people we've talked into doing it, you know, that's solidified that that common sense stuff works. What was it that you believed about money at 25 that you now know is completely wrong? That leverage is your friend, that you can borrow your way into wealth. And the data that we now have with all the research we've done in addition to our the anecdotal evidence of our lives and the lives that people we've walked with um, says otherwise. And so, you know, you and I both have a big following on TikTok, a rarity in that we both actually make sense in that venue. Uh, and so but there's a lot of trash on there, a lot of nothing down real estate and a lot of uh, borrow your way into prosperity. And that's actually 
the same exact thing I was doing in my 20s, 40 something years ago, you know. And so um, I believed exactly the same thing. I was doing the nothing down real estate thing before there was cable TV, before there was Chip and Joanna, before there was TikTok. And so, and crashed and burned. And it wasn't, I didn't crash and burn just because I didn't know how to do it. I was actually very good at it. Uh, but leverage will come back and hit you in the back of the head. This borrowed money thing is a problem, especially for the consumer, especially for a typical American or the typical person around the world that um, is saying, okay, your most powerful wealth building tool is your income. And when you commit that to someone else and rationalize and justify and intellectualize that that was smart, you still gave your money away and you still lost the ability to be generous with that money and you lost the ability to build wealth with that money. So I know you have a very hard line rule on leverage. Do you think that for some people it can make sense? Let's say if you can borrow money at 3% and make 8% in the market. For some people, does that make sense? Or do you really believe that for no one it makes sense? It's proven, again, anecdotally and, and with research we've done, that that formula that everybody uses is naive. So, for instance, and you know this, uh, and I know this from the spaces we work in, but for our, our listeners or viewers, you have to analyze risk in a financial equation. And when you have a financial equation that does not have risk in it mathematically, it is a primitive, naive financial equation. It doesn't work, in other words. And so if I can borrow money on my, on my mortgage at 3% and I can put it in a S&P 500 and make an average of 11 or 12, why am I not making that spread? Well, you left out taxes for one thing. The second thing is you left out risk. And you left out what having a mortgage on your personal residence where your kids and your dog and your spouse live, how much you carry that physically in your body. It's real. Mm -hmm. When you don't have a mortgage, you don't have a mortgage payment, and we have a, a, a Fauci quarantine, it's a different thing. You know, you don't have a, a problem. You don't have, have the same sense of stress. You don't feel it across your shoulder blades and down your back. And uh, people get so used to carrying the weight, they don't realize they're walking around with this backpack with weights in it. But you know, back to the mathematical analysis, it, in an investment analysis, we're taught in the worlds that you're in and I'm in that, that you don't compare an aggressive growth stock mutual fund apples to apples with a growth in income because the risk is much different. Aggressive gro growth is doing this and the growth in income is doing this. And those waves, the top and bottom of them, the differentiation in those is called a beta and it's a statistical measure of risk. A high beta, higher volatility. And so more debt, more beta should be applied. And no one teaches anywhere in finance to apply that beta, although we're taught on in investments, but to apply it to leverage. So when you borrow, uh, you know, more debt equals more risk, but nowhere does that, is that factored into the financial formula of, oh, I got the mortgage at 3% and I'm making 11. I'm making that spread. No, you're not. No, you're not because you've not risk adjusted. And when you risk adjust and tax adjust and inflation adjust, you just about did away with that spread. But don't you think at a certain point, people can make the risk analysis for themselves and say, OK, maybe I can take on the risk. And this, that spread is just maybe I can take on the risk. If you admit that the risk is there. But when you say I'm doing this, the way I'm justifying it mm -hmm. is I'm borrowing at three and I'm making 11. So I'm making an eight spread. No, you're not. I mean, you didn't do the analysis properly. If you do the analysis and you accept the risk, then that's your choice. That's okay. You're an adult. You get to do whatever you want to do. I'm not, I don't tell people what they have to do. I'm just saying this is what you ought to do. And, and there, there's a tremendous peace. And personal finance has aspects to it that are not in a vacuum. You know, like for instance, when you don't have a house payment, you choose to work a different job. You don't put up with a toxic environment. You walk a little different down the hall. You don't look like a victim to the toxic boss. And so, you know, you end up making more money at your career because you're secure. But you, don't, you can't factor that into this equation, but that's a reality in our relationships and our lives and our careers and everything else. But when you have to keep the job to pay the payments, you put up with stuff and you end up not getting raises and you end up not getting the po proper career track that you would have excelled in and all these other things. And so it affects 
a lot of areas of your life. Number one cause of divorce in North America today, money fights and money problems. Well, I mean, if you want to build wealth, ever so often getting divorced and splitting it with somebody is not a good formula. And that's not factored into this. And so you just keep going back to life and trying to put life in the mathematics. Then you kind of go, it doesn't work. I think that's interesting because I feel like there is always a financially optimal decision. And then there's the optimal decision for you. And a lot of times those aren't the same. Even your debt snowball method where you're paying off the loan amount that's smallest first and then making your way up isn't truly financially optimal. The financially optimal one one is probably debt avalanche where you're taking the highest interest rate and paying that off first. But I can see how in many cases it's better to give people the one that is optimal for them. I would disagree. It's not, it is uh, not financially optimal. It's mathematically optimal to do the avalanche. Good, I like the that. The math is is more correct. The debt snowball is mathematically incorrect. Again, until you factor in these nuanced pieces of math that we're not using when we do that simple analysis. The simple analysis is pay off the highest interest rate first, it goes faster, right? But it leaves out the probability of completion. And if you're gonna do a statistical analysis on something, you gotta have probability of completion. And almost no one, completes the debt avalanche and almost everyone completes the debt snowball because of the feedback loop psychologically because when you pay off something you get excited your hope level goes up and you keep going as a matter of fact when it ends up happening in our experience 10 million people going through financial peace university we've got the data to show it that what ends up happening is the more excited and hopeful people get the deeper they sacrifice they they sprint to the finish line Mm -hmm. instead of barely making it because all they did was an analysis with math in the head. But when you get the heart involved, personal finance, personal debt was not caused by math. It was caused by behavior mismanagement. I mean, no one can argue that it's smart to go 28% in debt on a credit card to buy a purse. I mean, that's not, there's no one can make that argument. Now you can say you're allowed to, you're entitled to, you can make these philosophical arguments, moral arguments, but you, you can't say, that it's smart mathematically, but, and and so it's a behavior problem. So how do you fix a behavior problem with a behavior solution, not a math solution? And that's why the feedback loops and all, and when you add in in probability of completion, meaning they actually do get out of debt into the math, then we win again. (laughs) You beat me too. I don't mean, I'm not beating you. I'm just saying but it's because I come out of that world, and so my fir- the, the math nerd world, yeah. and so it was what I had to overcome. So the first argument I had to win was with myself on this stuff. I had to go, why does this work? Because it shouldn't work. It ought to be the dead avalanche. Because that's what I'm a math nerd. I can't stand it, you know? And, and why does it work for me to tell people to temporarily stop their 401k and miss a match in order to get out of debt? Why does that work? Why do they have a higher probability of becoming a millionaire in a shorter number of years doing that? Because that's so bass backwards. It doesn't make sense, but it's not mathematically correct, but it's behaviorally correct. And that turns out that the behavior aspects of personal finance trump the math aspects. I like that. I know for me personally, when I had $200,000 of debt, I used debt avalanche. So I know debt avalanche can work for oh, some I didn't people. Say it, I, I didn't say it can't work. It mm-hmm. will work. And someone like you, as bright as you are and disciplined, your your whole life is a, is a picture of discipline and care, except for that student loan debt part. But I mean, the, the getting out, the way you put things together, the way you made this show so successful, all of that indicates that you have a high completion rate on a debt avalanche. But someone who's kind of wishy, and isn't you I've got to suck them in and it's the probability of completion. I'm not saying there's zero probability of completion on debt avalanche. Someone like you, yeah, you come out ahead. I don't have any question about that. The point is is that across the population of whoever we're dealing with, whether they're highly educated, highly structured, or whether they're not highly educated, not highly structured, anywhere in that spectrum, what I'm looking for is the highest probability of completion. Mm-hmm. And that snowball is a much higher But it's not, but debt avalanche is not a zero probability of completion. Were you ever in your money philosophy at a stage where you said, okay, here are the options. Here's debt avalanche. Here's debt snowball. One of these might be good for you. Or from when you started thinking about money, were you always, this is the right path for the majority of people. Therefore, this is the only path I'm going to recommend. There's something motivational about believing. And 
so much of what we do at Ramsey and what I've spent my life on is aspirational as much as informational. The mistake the financial community has made is they've tried to fix everything only with a math formula. And again, personal finance is 80% behavior, 20% head knowledge. And really, honestly, the math you need to become wealthy is about sixth grade level. It's not rocket science. It's not, it's not hard. So the clarity of purpose is motivational. When you continually just tell people over and over and over again, oh, there's 16 ways to do this, then what ends up happening is, is they do nothing. And it's just not good for the person I'm trying to help. And, and so... But I never take away someone's autonomy. You know, if you want to work your plan, work your plan. They call our show. I say, listen, work your plan. But don't tell me you're working my plan when you're working your plan. <laughs> don't. We'll, we'll have a. We'll talk about that. But, but, but if you're going to work, if you want to do, you know, Ramsey ish or Dave ish, as some of them call it, then that's not really my plan. You can go work your plan. You're like an adult. You have autonomy. You can go do that. And you, like you, you can be successful. And I'm not mad about that. It's okay. I'm happy for you. I want you to win. But that doesn't mean that this is wrong just because you want to do that. No, go do it. Go, go do it this way. And so being very specific and very sure of yourself is very motivational. I think it's one of the reasons we've been so successful is we don't vary. You probably know that I travel a lot. When I'm on the road and get some me time, I love to explore, but I don't want to see the same old tourist traps. I want an authentic experience. Knowing some of the local language can help you take your vacation to the next level and get an unforgettable experience. But we're all busy, right? So how do we fit this into our schedule? Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone is making language learning practical and prepares you for real-life conversations and real-life scenarios. From your very first lesson, you'll learn practical phrases so you can make connections with real people, not just random words. And they make learning possible for every schedule. Lessons are as short as 10 minutes, so you can learn between meetings, classes, and commutes. Since it's all on the Rosetta Stone app, you can take your learning anywhere, even when you're in a foreign country practicing your newly learned conversation skills. And because I'm a Rosetta Stone partner, you can get over 50% off a lifetime subscription. Usually it's $3.99, but you pay just $1.49. Their lifetime subscription means that you never have to pay renewal fees. You can learn multiple languages at your own pace. Start, stop, and review at your convenience. Visit erica.com slash Rosetta Stone Download the app and immerse yourself in a new language. I'll put the link in the description. I do think what you said, this analysis paralysis is so relevant and applicable to people. I remember when someone told me about a Roth IRA when I was in my early 20s, and I should have done it then. They motivated me. I was inspired. And then I started to go down this rabbit hole of Googling, okay, well, where should I open my Roth IRA? And I got into this spiral of analysis paralysis where I had so many options in front of me that I ended up not making a decision. And it wasn't until many years later that I actually opened my Roth IRA. And when you think about all the money that I lost due to not being able to have it compound through that analysis paralysis for many years, that's a lot of money. Well, for you know, exactly. And another thing that we do that's mathematically incorrect that falls right in that line is we tell folks, take the match first when you're doing your 15% into baby step four, 15% of your income going. Match is first, then Roth without exception, and then traditional. Okay. And uh, people say, well, I mean, what if, uh, you know, what if tax rates go up? And so what if at retirement, you've got a big old huge nest egg and you have to cash it out and you're going to, you're going to have a high tax bracket there. It offsets the benefit of the Roth. And I'm like, yeah, but here's a trick. Okay. Here's what we're tricking people into doing. So technically, if you wanted to compare Roth with traditional, a Roth is after tax. So you technically would have to compare a more money going into the Roth than going into the traditional. And because you got to pay the taxes before you get there. But by not even making that analysis, by just saying, okay, you can put 6,000 in this or you can put 6,000 in this. That's technically not correct because one's before tax and one's after tax. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be a math nerd and do the analysis, you'd say, okay, in order to do six, I have to start with eight and knock the taxes off. But we don't do that. We just say, put six in and the Roth's better. And if you do it that way, then you get people to do it. 
And as you said, not doing it is more costly than all this other junk. So just do it. Just put the money in the stinking it. The, the people that build wealth are the ones that put money in investments. They're not the ones that talk about it. Do you think that if I want to impact as many people as you have, I need to be more hardline about the rules I have around finance? Or do you think I can be successful by continuing what I currently do, which is here are the two options and you're going to have to pick what's best for you because personal finance is personal. I think you need to be you. You're already very successful. So I don't think we have any question about the, the data's in. Uh, Erica's successful. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, and I need to be me. And, uh, but I need to be consistent inside the Ramsey brand. You need to be consistent inside the Erica brand. A and, you know, they come to you because of that. And they come to me because of me. And, and so I don't, I don't, there's room for everybody to play in the sandbox. There's a lot of room and a lot of ways to be successful. So no, I, I think you've done so well. I don't think anybody could question your success. Thank you. I appreciate that. But I do think there's a lot of validity to having the rules like you do have. Because I always think for my health too, someone somewhere came up with this 10,000 steps a day. And we, truthfully, it depends on the person and depends on your day. You don't need 10,000 steps a day necessarily. But something about having that defined goal set for us, it gave us something to all work towards. And I feel like money is the same where if you just give seven steps, it's easy for people to follow instead of seven steps, but here are 20 different alternatives for each step. The person who understands the power of focus or just appreciates the simplicity of the power of focus does a whole lot better with the clear seven steps. The, the person who loves to analyze stuff to no end really struggles with me. They really struggle with my stuff. And because they can't, they just try and, it, well, I don't understand, that doesn't make, and, and they have to figure everything out instead of just doing it. And so I'm an impediment for them almost, or, or the way we teach is an impediment to them. But the clarity of a clear path in terms of creating a behavior shift, a transformation in someone's life, a clear path, you need to do these things in your marriage. If you do these five things in your marriage, you're going to see a different marriage. You need a clarity. We all need something that's a little bit simplified that way, you know, because if you get down into the nutrition rabbit hole, uh, and you don't limit calories and increase aerobic burn, you're not going to lose weight. <laughs> Hello, I don't care what your plan is. It's just not going to happen. I mean, you, there, there's no magic pill. So you're going to increase your aerobic burn and decrease your calories, or you're not going to lose weight. It's a very simple formula. And we can argue about all the nuance, but yeah, that, that's it. And what is the simple formula for money? Well, we teach people there's five principles that we ascertained from the pain that we went through and over the years. And then we've woven those into what you say, what you referenced, the seven baby steps. The five principles are generosity. People who win with money are, without exception, generous. And they're overly generous, more than the general public. People that win with money live on less than they make all the time. They are always, they create margin. Income minus outgo always equals a spread always live on less than we make. They always do it on purpose. They always have a plan. Some people have more detailed, nerdy, written budgets. Everyone has a plan. No one accidentally wins the Super Bowl. And so winning is an intentional act, and an intentional act always has a plan with it. And so in business, it's strategic thought followed by tactical application. In our personal lives, it's the budget. It's the budget. It's the budget. Getting out of debt and staying out of debt and then saving and investing and saving and investing, starting with an emergency fund to protect you from life and then beginning to invest college funds for kids and retirement funds and later on just wealth building in general. But if you don't do those five things woven into some kind of a system, you're simply not going to win. Those are the principles of life. And those are the common sense things I found uh, with those old people that were rich. And I find them with the millionaires and I found them in scripture as well. And so the, we wove those into a progressive linear step, series of steps, the seven baby steps, one's a thousand dollars saved, two's work the debt, snowball and get out of debt, everything but your house, three's finish the emergency fund, a proper three to six months, four is 15% of your income going into retirement, five kids college, and six is pay off your house early. And the typical person working that has been paying off their home in about seven years, and they're paying off their personal debt in 18 to 24 months. That's our our standard numbers. Now, that means some people take longer, some people take less, but depending on amounts of income and amounts of debt. But when you don't have any payments and you are managing your money on purpose, you can build wealth. 
and you can be generous. I mean, it's really, it's not rocket science, again. Why do you think even though it does seem like common sense, it's just so hard to follow? Several things. We're, we live in the most marketed to culture in the history of the world. The number of advertising impressions in front of our face. I mean, the number of times we open up our phone a day. And uh, the number of time you, you know, the time you spend on Instagram, the time you spend on the web in general, the time you spend in front of a television, if you decrease those, you'll decrease your spending because the marketers are phenomenal at selling me stuff and selling you stuff. I mean, they're really good. <laughs> Instagram influencer pops up and my daughter Rachel buys something every 20 minutes doing that. She's been on with you and um, yeah, she, she loves that stuff. And so we laugh about it all the time. But the, um, the marketing is just over the top. It's crazy. The, the second thing is these magic wands we have in our hands, friction to buy something, how difficult it is to buy something. I don't have to get in a covered wagon and travel half a day to go to the general store, then trade furs that I've trapped in the winter for some food. Okay, that's a high friction transaction in the pioneer setting, right? Instead, I've got a magic wand in my hand that not only has all of the Earth's knowledge available to me, plus or minus all the lies, but it also I can push a button, stuff shows up on my porch. Uh, I can push a button to find out the weather. I can, I mean, it's, it's an amazing thing. With that, though, our attention spans have shortened. From a mental health perspective, that's an indication of mental immaturity, emotional immaturity. And the more immature you are, the more impulsive you are. And the more impulsive you are in a setting where we live in the most marketed do culture in the history of the world. Oh, and by the way, one of the most marketed products out there is debt. Uh, more money spent marketing debt than just about any other product. And if you don't think credit cards and student loans are a product, ask the bankers. They'll tell you it's a product. You put the aggressive marketing of debt, the uh, ease and the shortened attention span and the impulsive nature increasing, and you mix that into the most marketed to culture in the history of the world, and that's what we're sitting in. I think the impulsive thing that you tapped in on is so key. There's an exercise that I do and I tell people about. It's the seven day rule where if you want to buy something, wait seven days. And if you still want it after those seven days, then you can buy it. But chances are you're going to realize that you actually didn't want it. It would have been an impulse purchase. And that simple exercise sounds simple, but it's actually quite hard to wait seven days. But if you can do it, you'll find a lot more clarity around your purchases. Well, and you don't have this financial hangover from that. You don't have this horrible taste on the back of your tongue called regret. You know, like, I feel stupid. I bought stuff later. And I look back on it. I feel stupid. Like, what was I doing? I'm just dumb. You know, you, that's, you don't want to talk to yourself that way, you know, not if you want to win. Yeah. And so that's a brilliant thing to do that. Uh, when we taught the original version of Financial Peace University 20 years ago, we had a thing in there. Buyer beware was one of the lessons. And we taught... We would teach people in those days, particularly a married couple, uh, your spouse, you have to talk to your spouse before you do a major purchase. You have to be in agreement. And that's husband or wife. It's not one way or the other. It's not like I have to ask my husband's permission. No, it's wife, you know, he has to ask his wife permission too. So if, if it's over $300, you have to wait overnight. And that's like your seven day, but just don't load the card up and then hit, you know, because there's very few things that we buy today that are actual needs. They're almost all wants. And if we work our tail ends off, we ought to buy some things we want, but we shouldn't classify them in our brain as a need. And you know this because you say, I need, no, you don't, <laughs> don't even use that word. Don't even use that word. You don't need anything. It's re I mean, we have, we're, we're pretty well fed. We're pretty well clothed. We got decent shelter and transportation. I mean, come on, your need stuff is just about not there. None of us, right? So that seven day rule is brilliant. I love that. Let's maybe go through the baby steps for people who aren't that familiar with it. I know we glossed through it, but I, I want to actually get into detail. So baby step one, save $1,000. And this is because why? Quickly, it's a starter beginner emergency fund. And when I first started teaching this, you ask if I'd changed anything. That's one thing I've changed. But that's a tactical thing, not a principle. I haven't changed the principles. What We used to just start with a debt snowball. Just shut up and get out of debt. I don't want to hear about it. You know, get, get beans and rice, rice and beans, scorched earth on the lifestyle, sell so much stuff the kids think they're next, get out of debt. But couples will be zero money because they're throwing everything at the debt and a tire would blow out on their car and they need $200 to put a tire on the car. And they're going, and they would become 
disillusioned and lose their hope and fall off the wagon. And I never could get them back on. And so I had to put a little pad to catch the little stuff. Now, it's not to scratch the itch for the saver. The saver really wants to have that money built up. I want them to be a little uncomfortable and use that discomfort to push on through the debt snowball. And so the the $1,000 is not the, obviously it's not enough. It's not the proper amount, but it's at least a little pad to catch the little stuff so you don't fall off the wagon. Because when you're first starting and you're broke, everything's an emergency. Every little thing. I mean, the cat gets sick. It's an emergency. We don't have stuff like that in our budgets when we're first starting because we've been so chaotic and disorganized. And when we first start laying everything out, oh, the kid's field trip is an emergency. They forgot to tell me. And I got a, or the activity fee at school, $46 is not in the budget. Every dadgum thing, because we're so incompetent at budgeting and laying out our stuff when we first start, all of us. Mm -hmm. So that's what the $1,000 is for. But you shouldn't stay there long. You know, again, it's 12 to 18 months or 18 to 24 months to be debt free on average, except the house in baby step two. And then you're going to really build a proper emergency fund. So I'm not suggesting that a thousand dollars is the right amount for a long term thing. It's just a little cushion so you can dive into the debt thing and actually stay on the wagon. Got it. And baby step two is the payoff all of your debt except for your mortgage. Using the debt snowball, right? Got it. Payoff everything with great focused intensity. Stop investing. You know, take any investments or savings that is not in a retirement and throw it at that debt. So you got $20,000 in a mutual fund laying over here that your granny gave you or something. Cash it in, throw it at it. Uh, You might want to sell a car. You might, you know, sit on a $40,000 car and making $60,000, you might want to sell a car. Uh, that kind of stuff. So you got to you got to get very focused, very intense, like your life depends on it. Um, because what we've discovered is that that portion right there has to be done at an emotional sprint. It cannot be a marathon. It cannot be st- slow and steady. Slow and steady does not win the race. There, you've got to get so like like your broke friends think you've joined a cult. You know, I mean, you got to be cray cray. You got to be, I mean, and the the wilder you get, the faster you get out, the higher the probability you're going to get out and never go back. Uh, you won't fall off. But the people who kind of think they're going to want, they wander into debt. But you can't wander out. You can, but you're very unlikely to. And, and so we just teach people to get blinders on this extreme focus. And the weird thing is that has worked so well that that's what I became named, known for is getting people out of debt. And it's not really what I do. What I really do is teach people how to become wealthy. We were so successful on a large scale of mm-hmm. getting people out of debt that that's what, you know, if you, if you just walk up on the street, apparently based on our branding right now, one third of Americans know who Dave Ramsey is, right? Um, weird, but okay, what do you, what, who's Dave Ramsey? He's the debt guy, you know, almost always, right? Unless they've been deep down into our stuff and they go, no, he's the money guy. Or he helped me get, he helped me become a millionaire, which is actually what I was trying to do. <laughs> but the debt thing was just in the way. And it, 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 we were so successful at it in that baby step too. So that's become really brand central accidentally because of the success of it. I think it's true though, that you have to go at debt with an intensity, because if you think that the debt is going to get paid off within your current lifestyle, that's the wrong way to do it. It should be your lifestyle shifts to get rid of the debt. And then when you're debt-free, we can talk about maybe upgrading your lifestyle a little. Like when I had $200,000 of debt, I was a fresh graduate, went to my very first fancy law firm, and people thought I was crazy because I would do silly things like instead of paying $3 for the bus, I would walk to work 30 minutes each day in my suit. And people thought, well, like $3, that's insignificant. You have $200,000 of debt. But it's kind of the mental discipline Mm -hmm. And also the intensity around this is how badly I want to get out of debt, that even $3 makes a difference to me that I think helped me to pay it off so quickly. Well, oh, it absolutely did. It absolutely did. And what you were embracing there intentionally, obviously, was this idea, transformation of a behavior. It's a force. And you don't engage that force unless you take every little thing in your life and you change it and tweak it and point it at that. Every time you acquiesce every time you surrender oh well it's just three dollars you you limit not it's not the three dollars you limit the force at which you're going at this Mm -hmm. and it slows slows us down the focus is a force multiplier and and you you don't get any momentum 
You don't get anything happening, moving. You can't push the rock up the hill, you know, if I go, well, I can take a day off. I can do, you know, you know and it's like this and that, and I can do this, and I'm allowed to do that. And yeah, you're allowed to do whatever you want to do. But, you know, what do you want to do? What you're trying to do is win. I'm trying to get rid of 200 freaking thousand dollars and you got to, you know, that's what gets you out. It's not the, I'm going to do a mathematical analysis. of No, you know, that doesn't get you out. What about the people? I'm sure a lot of people get stuck at baby step two because they're saying, well, I don't even make enough money to cover my bills. So how am I supposed to start paying off my debt? What do you say to them? We have to get down into their budget and figure out why they can't. One thing we always look at is I do a lot of, uh, you know, we do a live radio show that, that's podcast and YouTube and everything else, but it's live. And so 30 years of doing that, I do big math, I call it. In other words, so I'm not, you know, crunching the details of an interest rate and exactly how that's going to play out. But I mean, basically you go, okay, you got $50,000 in debt. I make 125000 Uh If you were to pay that off in a year, you need to live on 75000 did I leave out taxes? Yeah. Did I leave out interest rate? Yeah. But I mean, really, I mean, we're not going to do all that anyway. So basically, you know, you know, you, you got to find four or five grand a month here. Well, what about this? And well, you got to cut that. And what about that? And well, you're going to cut that out. And what about that trip I had planned to Rome? You're not going. And you know, if you, if, but if you can't live on 75,000 and we well, ought to be able to do that, that's quick math. Right. And, but that's the shovel to hole ratio. What is the shovel is your income? The holes, the 50,000. If you reverse that and said, I make 50,000, I got 125,000. Eh, okay. Something else has got to give here because 25,000 of that 50, you're living on nothing for five years to pay off 125. And that's not counting taxes and not counting interest. That's going to be hard. So we've got another problem there and that's the income problem. And so we've got to start saying, okay, what about the career? What about the side hustle? What about the core career? What do we do different with it? And what's amazing is, you know, we do these things called debt-free screams where people come on the show and they scream about, they, they go, I'm debt-free. But before that, we interview them and find out what they did and how they did it. And 96% of them, 97% of them had an income increase during the 24 months, mm-hmm. during the 36 months, during the whatever. And dramatic income increases sometimes. And I always ask them, why'd you do that? Well, I wasn't really paying attention. And then when I looked up and I needed some money to get out of debt, I went to my boss and said, I need a raise, you know, or I changed jobs and they're paying me 40% more at this other place. And I don't, wouldn't have thought about that, but I needed the money to get out of debt. And so it ends up impacting indirectly the whole career choice thing as well. But sometimes the answer to your question is it's an income problem. And that means we're going to be doing some side hustles, start a small business, change jobs, change careers. A spouse may that's not working may end up working. You might end up doing all kinds of things. But people can do, again, we're not having to do that for a long period of time. If you take a, a, someone's a nurse and they're working 40 hours, they can, make, they can work 80 instantly. And the second 40 is going to pay a lot. And if you do that for a short period of time, 18 months, and you clean up everything, then you got your life back for the rest of your life. Working an extra job or working extra hours as a way of life sucks, but doing it for a short period of time to hit that goal and then you're free, that's how you break the log jam. For people listening who are trying to figure out, well, do I have an income issue or do I have a spending issue? What exercises should they go through to determine where they should be cutting or increasing? Well, I would just be looking at both. I think almost 100% of us have a spending issue in the world we live in today. There's stuff we spend money on we don't have to. And if I have a goal that is more important than that stupid thing I was getting ready to buy, which almost always would be true, then I can hit that goal. I always tell people, you know, that have children is if you have a, you know, I've I've got seven grandkids. And if if one of those grandkids had an illness and I need $10,000 that I don't have today in two months to save their life, by God, I can cut spending. Mm -hmm. I can work, I can get some, in, I, I'll find some money. And so it, it just, how important it is, it is the question, you know, it's like, well, I don't know if I really, well, then you're not going to do it, you know, but if you go, this is life or death, this is the quality of life. You know, I'm, I'm 28 years old. And if I'm a hundred percent debt-free by the time I'm 31 and I'm a millionaire by the time I'm 37, 
the quality of life you have from 37 to 87 is dramatically different because you paid a price during the short period of time and you were like a grown up and you delayed pleasure. Adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good. And so we can do these things if we want to, but we just, it just has to become a thing in our head where it's, there has to be a big enough why, a big enough reason. And I think having the feedback of those psychological wins too is really important to show you that yes you have this goal yes it might take a year two years five years to get there but you're making the right steps so even with my dad i remember i divided it into these mini goals so when i paid off the first ten thousand dollars that was a huge mini goal for me and i went on i don't know how i celebrated but i did something to celebrate yeah absolutely and when i got under a hundred thousand dollars of debt that was another huge mini goal And so going back to what we were talking about with the snowball, I think the snowball is great in that aspect of it gives you those wins along the way. And that first win, you're going to hit it pretty quickly. Like by Friday, probably. (laughs) Because, you you know, a lot of people have a $70 medical bill from diagnostic something. If you drive past the doctor, you get a bill from something diagnostic. You know what I mean? It's like, so... You, you knock out a bunch of this little mosquitoes that have been flying around your head for six months, clouding your vision on being able to see your big deal. What happens is you change who you are in this journey. When you made that walk to avoid a $3 bus fare, it wasn't $3 bus fare. It changed Erica. She's a different person because of that. And she doesn't ever want to go back to being that other person. She's a much better version of her now, and, and she, she knows, has zero regret, and that's 100% of everybody out there that does it. You pay a price to win. People don't understand. They make fun of you. It doesn't matter. When you get to the other side of it and, and, and you, 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 know, you do a touchdown dance in the middle of the Super Bowl, freaking one, knocked out $200,000. Shut up. I, you know, yes, would you do it again? Oh, I would do it again. I'd only do it faster next time. Right. Yeah. Everybody does that because the transformation of the human has occurred, not just the mathematics. But I can see, you know, I remember when I was going into this, paying off my debt. Sometimes it's so dark and cloudy around that it's actually hard to see the finish line and it's hard to visualize what will it feel like to be debt free because you just feel like it's impossible. How do you help people to get out of that mindset of, oh, it's not even possible for me. I'm never going to be out of this debt. That's what the debt-free scream is, is social proof. They did it, and she's a single mom, and she's a waitress on the weekends, and she's a teacher, and she's got two little kids standing there beside her, and they're looking up at their mom like she's a princess warrior because she is. I mean, that's that's a woman that did something right there, man, and that's my favorite people out there, you know. 30 million people are watching that and we've had a billion and a half downloads on youtube and so that's literal which blows my mind but i mean a lot of it is people watching the social proof they they see someone that looks like them that did it and that says i can do it and that's one of the reasons we do it the other reason we do it is it's a milestone you know you hit ten thousand. you hit a hundred thousand i need a, i need a celebration well this is the celebration at the end you get you know you you come and you get to show off and stand with confetti going around you and social proof is everything um the other thing is if you're going to modify behavior you've got to have uh people in your life some way or another that are holding you accountable and encouraging you they can't be just one or the other they can't be cheerleaders with no accountability but they can't be all accountability with no cheering And, and so this is somebody who loves you really loves you and they go hey erica that's stupid don't do that you know, and you go, oh, you love me, and I, I got to stop and think. I really don't need to buy that because that person loves me, and they, they, they have some sense, and I trust them. And you know, and so in Financial Peace University, we have small group discussion after the class, and those small groups become very tight. And I've met people who, ten years later, still go on vacations with someone that was in their small group because that was a, it was a, a, a pinnacle, a relationally and emotionally, when they were fighting together in the foxhole and the, the enemy's trying to overrun them and they can't. Uh, and, and when you bond with someone like that, that, a lot of those relationships are for the rest of their lives. And I know it's a bit controversial when I say it, but I don't think it's a bad idea to look at your circle and see if their financial values align with yours. I think it 
can really be detrimental to meeting your financial goals if you have a friend who is always encouraging you to go out to fancy dinners and overspend, or if you have a friend who doesn't support you in that way. So I don't think it's a bad idea, especially when you're getting out of debt, to really look at the people around you and assess, are they aligned with my financial values? I guess I'm a boomer because I don't know why that's controversial. <laughs> I, think I, that's, guess... I think that's common sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You're going to become who you hang around with. I got a buddy of mine who, who has uh, not had a drink uh, in 12 years. He was a drunk and he just about lost his wife. He just about lost his family. And so he can't run around with all the time people that all they do is drink. Now, he can now after 12 years of so sobriety. But when he's trying to break that, you can't run with your drinking buddies if you're trying to stop drinking. Hello. You know, you can't run with your spending buddies who are out of control, chaotic, have no budget, no future, no plans, plan to keep their student loan around forever. If you want to get rid of yours, you're not going to do it because they normalize in your, they regulate your body and, and they normalize what's happening. And, and there's all kinds of data. I mean, there's research that shows 10 years from now, you, your average income will be within 10 or 15% of your 10 closest friends income. Mm. You know, I mean, there's all kinds of data that says, you know, are you going to stay married? If you run around with a whole bunch of people that are divorced, probably not because it normalizes that the first time there's a problem instead of fighting through it, we X the marriage, you know? And so you, you become who you hang around with. I mean, crud, we even pick up the accents, uh, the words, the way the sentences are formed. Oh, you're, you know, you're a hillbilly, you're a Cajun, you're an Italian, you know? And, but why is that? That's who we run with. It's our, it's our tribe. And, and so I can even hear, because I'm hillbilly, I can even hear the differences in East Tennessee and Middle Tennessee, you know, and, and you know, the word, a couple of nuanced words, I can pick it up and I go, you're, you're from over there, you know, but it's who we run with. It's who we hang out with. And so the books you read, the podcasts, you know, and, and so that's why I, I'm always super thrilled when someone like you completely comes into this space and just blows up. Uh, because you're, or, or, you know, that's why we have a Rachel Cruz on our team and a, a Ken Coleman on our team. And, a, you know, we've got all these Ramsey personalities is because a lot of people just don't like Dave and that's okay. Oh. <laughs> no, they don't. That's okay. I'm, I'm cool with that. that. That's why we need an Erica. That's why we need a Rachel because I, you know, I can't get to everybody. And so, but if, if we as a community that do this are big and we have a similar think pieces of information and uh, coming off. I mean, we don't have to be exact, but I mean, we're, we're generally in agreement. You can't spend more than you make. We're generally in agreement. You ought to have a freaking plan, you know, and, and then, and this is what you're listening to instead of you're listening to some influencer about spending stuff all the time, then even your podcast friends that aren't re your real friends, they don't really know us personally, but they kind of know who we are because we're pretty real. That it influences everything. Oh, it's yeah. absolutely vital. You know, so you need to choose real carefully who you run with. That stat about how your net worth yeah. is related to the people's net worth around you. That's so interesting. I had never heard that. No, it, no, and by the way, let's just be real clear. What might be controversial is it acts like we're snobs or something. No, I'm not saying never associate with. I'll, I'll help anybody. Even people I vehemently disagree with their theological stand or their cultural stand or what i don't care i'm not mad at you. if you can leave all that over there i'll help you right here me, me and you well because I, I like people and i want you to win and so i'm not a, i'm not too snobby to, but that, but those people aren't necessarily going to be my crew mm -hmm. they're not going to be my posse the group the tight who's your closest five there's an old motivator in the 60s named charlie tremendous jones and he had a saying five years from today you'll be the same person you are today except for the books you read and the people you run with mm. I really like that. So I got to hang around you more often. <laughs> Your net worth is way higher. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to hang around you because you got a lot more people on TikTok or, or something like that. So it's good. <laughs> so baby step two, we got that. I feel really good about that. So next, take us to baby step three. That's just finish the emergency fund, which for the saver, most of us are either primarily savers or spenders. I'm a spender. So the Finishing the emergency fund was not sexy for me. I didn't, but boy, it's big time for my wife, especially after going broke and two little babies. Oh, she, man, her security gland was spasming. 
right? So getting that three to six months of expenses in there. And I mean, honestly, we've never even touched it. We, we because she just, it, it, it's a psychological thing for her. It's a scar from the terror that she went through when my stupidity caused us to go broke. Right. And she got, got to go along for the ride, bless her heart. So in our case, that, that thing, it, it represents relational things and psychological things. But the practical thing is that's just grandma's rainy day fund. And it's just three to six months of expenses. And if you want six, because you just feel better, if you got a little pile of cash, that's okay. The weird thing is by the time you get there, you're budgeting better and there's not as many emergencies mm -hmm. and every little thing is not an emergency anymore. And the more and more and more margin you get and the more net worth you get, I mean, I don't know what you could get to that's an emergency. Yeah. And tell me if you agree or disagree, but I think for uh, an emergency fund, you should keep it in a high yield savings account yes. separate from your normal checking account. Because I know how it was when I had very little money. It's very easy to take your savings and put them back into checking and make that little dance back and forth. But if you have a high yield savings account that's separate, it makes it a little tougher to withdraw it. It creates that barrier, that mental and emotional barrier, and you're earning more interest on it than 0.01%. Exactly. It's not about the interest. It's about the protection, but never have it connected. No overdraft protection, no ATM access, no debit card on it because that'll keep you from impulsing a couch. Yeah. And by the way, a couch is not an emergency <laughs> just, just to help you with the definition here, you know, so, or I, you know, I need, oh, 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 oh. when you, you got to stay away from that thing. It's there just for when Bad things that are unexpected happen, and Christmas is not unexpected. It's always in December. They don't move it. And so, the, you know, that kind of stuff, you have to disconnect that. That's very wise, yes. Now they have their emergency fund. What is next? Okay, now we have no debt except the house, and we have three to six months of expenses. That feels completely different than 90% of the people walking around. <sighs> wow. Now we move from that intensity that hyped up what we call gazelle intensity to intentional. Now we move from the sprint to the marathon. And baby steps four, five, and six, we do them simultaneously. Four is first, and we start putting 15% of our income into retirement. First to the match, second to Roth. And if you got a match with Roth, that much better. And then if you can't get there with those two things, then pick up some traditional. Uh, but get to 15%. Don't do 20, and don't do 12. And don't try to figure out, oh, well, what about you? Just do it. Just put 15% of your money away. Okay. You got plenty of margin in this budget now because you got no payments but a house payment. Unless you've got an outrageous house payment, this is very doable. Then you start doing something for kids' college if you've got kids and if it applies. Is baby step five and six is any other margin while we're living life. Now we go on a trip. Now we upgrade the car. Now we buy the couch intentionally agreement with our spouse. In your case, wait seven days. I love that. And that, that kind of thing. So while we're doing all those things, but we try to find, in spite of all these other things, some extra to th start throwing on that house. And just instead of running at the house debt, just chipping away at it, chipping away at it. And in the millionaire study we did, the average person from the time they start the whole process to house payoff is 10.2 years. In the Ramsey set of the Ramsey tribe set of the, the research we did in the non-Ramsey was 11.6. But so anyway, well, just right around 10 years, you get the house paid off from the time you start the whole thing, mm. not from the time you start paying on the house. So you know, remember, it's 18 to 24 months to get out of debt. Then you got another six or eight months to get that emergency fund built. And so it's about a seven year chipping away at the house. And it's just we're going to throw some over there. We're just going to throw some over there. And, you know, we get a little bonus here. Well, we don't. Okay, we got the trip covered. We're okay, we're going to throw it over there. And you don't have to put it all on there. And it's not with intensity. It's just with intentionality. And when that house is clear, oh, man, we're talking to these kids in their 20s now. And they're coming in. And they're doing debt-free screams. They're 26 years old. And their house is paid for. And they make $100,000, $150,000 a year. The math on that, I mean, they're going to be millionaires so fast that if they're not, if they don't have a 10 to $20 million net worth at 65, it's because they really screwed something up because it sets the table mathematically. Now, I think we're now at baby step seven. Mm -hmm. What is baby step seven? Seven is everything's paid off. Uh, well, after, after college, just pay off the house is six. 
Now, when the house is paid off, that's where you're just nothing left to do but become very wealthy and outrageously generous. And so now you're just systematically investing. You're systematically enjoying your lifestyle uh, without it getting out of control so that you can't invest. And we've even systematized a lot of our generosity and gotten more, much more intentional and careful about that because the dollars of the generosity demanded that we be wiser and less impulsive with our generosity. So, you know, that's been a, a joy ride. What do you think are the three things that people have to know about getting wealth? The thing we discovered that was a little bit surprising in the millionaire study was the first thing is they actually have to believe they can. And that sounds so frou-frou or positive thinking or whatever, but it's if you don't believe it's possible, you will not go about the steps to do it. Mm. If you don't believe if I eat less and exercise more, I'll lose weight, then you will never do it. Well, no matter what I do, if I, and I, I can't. No, it, it won't work. You know, well, then why would you do it? That's psychologically it's inconsistent. So you wouldn't do that. So you have to believe. And it's, it, it sounds a little bit frou-frou it's our positive thinking. But, you know, you can also believe it's going to be hard. Oh, well, so is being broke. So we might as well do something hard that works. But the belief thing is a, a big deal. The second thing is, is, is I would go back to what you said earlier, and I think that was very wise. You have to be real careful about what your inputs are including your friends, your podcasts that you're watching and listening, your, your books you're reading, you're going to become those things. And, you know, if, if you have a whole bunch of movement coming at you all the time that's saying you can't do it or giving you conflicting information where you, all your, your plan is just fits and starts instead of playing through, then you're not going to do it. So be real careful with your inputs, and that includes your whole culture of your life. And again, that doesn't mean we're not going to be nice to somebody outside that group. We're always going to be kind to those people. But but the, I'm just talking about who's influencing me, not who I'm influencing. And I don't know what the third one is. I guess have a plan. Yeah, and it would be. It would be have a plan. The strategic is the overarching macro belief of if we do these things, and then the tactical is $3.00. And I'm walking. I like that. The first point you were saying about you have to believe that you are going to be a millionaire. I remember probably 10 years ago, if you would have asked me if I would become a millionaire, I would say no, because I didn't grow up. I didn't know a single millionaire growing up, so I didn't see that it was possible. And so when I did a survey of my audience, I think I surveyed 10,000 people. I asked them this. Do you think you're going to be a millionaire? And I want to say something like 60 percent said no. When we did the survey on the millionaires, 97%, we said, can someone become a millionaire today in America? 97% said yes. Well, no kidding. You ask, ask 10,000 people that just rode a bicycle, can people ride a bicycle? Of course, 97% are going to say, yes, they can ride a bicycle. They've done it. They believe it can be done. It's not confirmation bias, but it's pretty close in research. But we asked the general public in white space, and we got 69% said they thought they could. So uh, a little higher than what you found. If you think you can or you think you can't, you're right, Henry Ford said. And that's just real. I mean, that really is. And so why would we engage in something hard uh, if we think the result is not there? No one would do that. That's, that's, in, that's just lo not logical. There's a sadness around that because what it means is a lack of hope, hopelessness, uh, because that belief is hope is what it is. What do you think you've done differently? where there's millionaires, and then I've read that you're close to a billionaire. What did you have to shift about yourself to go from that million-dollar mark to hundreds of millions of dollars? The millionaires that we found, the first one to five million is generally, I mean, almost a template. We found it so often that it almost became a stereotype that it, let, let's say someone had a million and a half dollar net worth. They often had a $600,000 paid for house and they're 52 years old, and they had a, this is the averages, and they had 800000 or 900000 in a, in a 401k. You cannot become a billionaire with a 401k. It's mathematically impossible. You can't put enough in it, and it can't grow fast enough for that to happen. And so when you study then billionaires that have done it, and 67, all the Forbes 400 right now are billionaires, 67% of them are first generation, two out of three. And so can, that can be done, too, in other words. There's a belief thing. Uh, but almost none of them did it with the slow and steady investing. They almost all were first millionaires with the slow and steady. Mm -hmm. uh, but then they had some kind of a business that they had built. 
and they either took it public or they just own a very profitable uh, business. And that would be the case with me is, is that we've just uh, the, the Ramsey Solutions is uh, 300 million a year top line and uh, almost 1,100 team members. And so it's a, it's a business. It's a, and so that should have caused me to build wealth way beyond my 401k, you know, mathematically. But I mean, you're talking about in the Fortune 400, you're talking about like Oprah, huge business. And we think of her as Oprah, but she's a, she's an industry. Okay. And, um, and a good one. She's really good at business. Uh, Michael Dell, Dell computers, you know, of course, Gates on Microsoft, of course, uh, the Walmart family. These are all business, the Truett Cathy, the Chick-fil-A people, uh, you know, all of those are businesses that did that. And if you go down through the whole list, almost every one of them have almost a recognizable business, or maybe they don't, but when you dig into where the wealth came from, it was someone that, built something that generated more than the person generated. Do you ever worry, this is something I personally struggle with, that the more money you accumulate, the further you get away from remembering or understanding what the average person who's following you feels like and is dealing with? Not much. And the reason is that the thing we went through losing everything was so extreme and the terror and the fear, you know, again, right the year Rachel was born, our water got cut off and our electricity got cut off to our house because I couldn't pay the bill. I can sit here right now, 32 years later, and feel that emotion in my throat. Right this second while I'm saying it, I can feel it. So I, I don't think I'll ever lose it. I don't think I, the scars are too deep for, the, to, for that to not be fresh. It's not that I need therapy or something. That's not the point. But, you know, when you have an extreme trauma, like that, it rests close enough to the top that I can get there. And so I can be smart aleck with a caller one minute and dicing them up because they came at me or something. And then the next minute I've got a, a lady and I, I start listening. I can hear the pain in her voice all of a sudden. And I'll just change instantly to be there for her because I can, I can hear the tears are close to the top because I, I looked across the table at those same terrified eyes in my wife's body when we were going through this stuff. Um, and I know how she felt. I know how I felt. I felt so inept. I felt so incomplete. I was such a bad husband, you know, and dad. Who gets her water cut off, you know? I mean, oh, my gosh, you know? So I can remember. I remember those shame feelings and those, you know, all that stuff comes back very quickly. So uh, that's the benefit of having been through that is that I, I don't forget. How did you work through that with your wife during those toughest times? I should tell the truth, but I need to be careful. Um, <laughs> the first thing is we didn't uh, for three years. We were just holding on to babies and to each other. And we laugh and the way we laugh and say it is, is Sharon would have left, but she didn't have a car, you know? So it was like, <laughs> you know, all we were doing was just hang, we were just trying to eat and get away from the terror to some sense of normalcy. So we didn't deal with the, uh, her feelings towards me in that, or my feelings of, uh, shame. And, you know, I just had to go to work. I didn't have a choice. You know, I, I don't care how you feel. You gotta get up. The baby has to be fed. I gotta get up, go do something. And, and so we stuffed it and didn't deal with it. And then that, that happened. And we were married about seven years when that happened. And about the 10 year mark, we got to making a little bit of money. Everything kind of calmed down, and those feelings, all that junk surfaced, and we about killed each other. It was nasty, and we ended up in a marriage counselor for about three years who is uh, to this day one of our best friends. She saved our marriage because we did not have the tools to navigate that level of uh, hurt and scars by ourselves, but we, we put it off three years. You know, and then boy, boy, when it came back, it was raging. We now have the choice to leave. We now have the choice to, to deal with this. We have the luxury of having an emotion, you know, and so it was, it was bad, but we got through it and um, now we've been married 42 years. So congratulations. life is good and life is really good right now. I mean, it's awesome. We talked about it earlier, how money is the biggest cause of divorce. What do you think people really need to be doing to prevent that from being an issue in their marriage? Apparently, this is controversial. Um, you need to be working together. 
<laughs> I'll fight you on this a little. I know what you're going to say, so I'll fight you. <laughs> the data, again, says that when you dream together and you are in agreement on where our money is going together, uh, that you have a higher probability of getting there. And uh, marriages, all relationships, but marriages in particular, are always growing together or they're growing apart. And if we don't have a high definition in HD, very clear place we are going to, this is where we're going to, and we're in agreement that we're going to go there, then we can't have intelligent arguments about how to get there. My wife is very smart and very strong-willed. Uh, so the idea that Dave Ramsey is going to tell her what to do, she's not impressed with Dave Ramsey, I'll just tell you. <laughs> okay, so what we're arguing about is not the goal. All we're worried about is which play we're going to call to put the ball in the end zone to win the Super Bowl. We're, we're not arguing about putting the ball over the line. We're arguing about which how to get there. And that's a good argument then because we're not fighting with each other. We're fighting about ideas. And that's, that's good. Iron sharpens iron then. And that's a healthy way to do conflict and a healthy way to communicate in a marriage and draw together. But uh, where we're just independent and my spouse is just my roommate, you know, the preacher didn't say, and now you are a joint venture. The preacher said, and now you are one. Mm. And that oneness ends up showing up in the math and in the data on the results of the people that are able to build wealth. So this is one where I feel like I just have a fundamentally different belief where I think you're saying that if you're married, you must have a joint account and only the joint account and keep all your money together. Is that right? Yeah. My philosophy is I like the idea of a joint account, but I do think that each person should also have a separate account, a yours, mine, and ours. Why do you think it is that separate accounts would cause issues? Because if anything, I feel like they create stability and security. It only creates stability and security if in one account, both of you don't have an equal vote. If my wife has the ability to say, I really want to do this, and I go, ugh, I don't really want to do it, but it's important to you, that's the same as her having an account. Because she still gets to do everything that her account would have done as long as we have a method in our relationship for coming into agreement. The separate accounts limits the, the quality of communication on the detail. The nuance is gone because you just do your thing over here and he doesn't even know. And I mean, he knows that amount of money is yours, but, you know, there's no discussion about that. But, you know, I, I'll, something stupid. I bought a, a tractor for my farm just for no reason, just to play on, okay? And Sharon's like, why? I said, I, I'm thinking about buying this tractor. What do you think? Now, obviously, I got the money by the truck. It's not stupid. And, and she's like, why are you doing that? I said, well, actually, I have no really good reason. I just want the stupid thing. And she goes, well, all right. And But now what happens is I don't have her looking over there at that silly little toy, okay, and going, has he lost his mind? We had a discussion about it because we don't buy things without discussing them together uh, of, of substance, uh, of size like that. That was a, you know, a big toy. The increased quality of communication just to keep each other in the loop on everything is forced into the thing. There's no harm in the other. It just, it, you, there's just some relational things that are missed and I think it takes some of the edges off. But again, it, it's the difference in the avalanche or the snowball. It, as long as you're doing it on purpose and there's a lot of talk about it, I don't care. Go do it. I found a whole bunch, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of stories of people say in Financial Peace University, one of the, they come in and they're in disarray, complete chaos in their finances. And usually one of them is is the master of the checkbook but not not doing a good job and the other one is pissed off about nothing and everything you know and so when we force them to talk about it in detail and force them into one account on a practical level to do that what we end up doing is forcing a bunch of communication that wasn't happening and they often thousand tens of thousands of times have said you guys saved our marriage you guys saved our marriage you guys saved our marriage and I didn't, I'm like, 
the sex class was down the hall. We weren't teaching that. What are you talking about? And, and they're like, well, no, you forced us to communicate. You by that. And the one account was the practical, tactical thing that, that forced that communication to, and, and this cleaning up of the chaos and creating an organization and creating, we're talking to each other before we do things. We're talking to each other before we do things. Because oftentimes the king or the queen of the checkbook has a lot of shame because things are out of control, but they do like the power. And the other one's like, oh, my wife would tell you, she's like, her favorite Southern saying was, whatever you want to do, honey. Well, that's death. That's death because I can do some stupid stuff, obviously. So instead she says, why are you doing that? And that's a much better question. Yeah. Maybe it's the lawyer in me that all I think about is divorce and how when things end badly, going back to what we were talking about, about risk analysis, I feel like the better risk analysis is to have your own separate accounts, even though you can have your joint account, to have the separate accounts so that if things end badly, what you have that In stability. what state do you not have to split up the personal assets? There, there's the <laughs> law, but then there's like... We both know there's practically how things happen. Well, if you have to hide money from your spouse because your marriage is going to end, then you got another issue. But it's not about, <laughs> I don't think it's about hiding. It's about having the autonomy with no question. Yeah. Divorces can carry out for many years. There's the legal system, and then there, there's again what happens in reality. And I feel like if you're going into a divorce, so we, 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 my, I, I can agree with you. But if you're not going into, a, if you're not planning your divorce, no one then, plans their divorce. Uh... <laughs> Dave, no one plans their divorce. Yeah, that's called a prenup. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Agree to disagree on that one. I know one of the things that you talk about in Baby Steps Millionaires is how even the people who think they cannot become millionaires can become millionaires. What are you saying to those people? Well, what's interesting in the data that we found was one third of them, 33% of the people that became millionaires. Again, we studied 10,000 of them. It's the largest study of millionaires ever done in North America. The research process and methodology was airtight. And we actually had an outside firm look over our shoulders so that because we knew we would be criticized about it. We knew the con conclusions would be controversial because there's so many people say that the American dream is dead. You can't do it. The hope stealers are out there. They're out there telling everybody it can't be done. And it's awful. And we should march in the streets and we should uh, whatever, all this stuff. But it can be done. And we proved it over and over. One third of the people never made more than a $100,000 household income. And the top five uh, careers that showed up, number one was engineer, most likely, highest probability. Number two, accountant. Number three, teacher. Mm -hmm. Blew my mind. Did not see that one coming. Because I always think of teachers as underpaid, like they should make more. They are underpaid. I know they are <laughs> underpaid. I, but I'm, I, for putting up as parents, if nothing else. And then no, number three was business executive, which can mean anything. Uh, and, and number four was lawyer. Docs, medical doctor, didn't even make top five. Yeah, so uh, they were number six. And so, but they're stereotypically horrible with money. Uh, they make a lot, but they're just, they, they fall for anything and they're arrogant in their approaches and they don't take input from other people. And they think because they're a brilliant doctor that they're going to be good at this and they're horrible lawyers. So what we couldn't figure out was in those five think, five groups of people that were in the top, what did they have in common? Because it wasn't, uh, there was education across all of them, but it wasn't necessarily high levels of education. There wasn't, we finally pulled back and the conclusion we came to was they're all five engineer, accountant, teacher, business executive, lawyer. They're all process people that believe there's a system. And if you follow a system, it works. You can't do litigation. If you don't follow the system, your honor will smack you down, right? <laughs> you can't run business without best practices. Okay, Teachers always have a lesson plan. It's a process, a proven plan. You don't make up your own deal. Accountants don't make up their own deal. There's generally accepted accounting principles. You don't have your own version of this. I, well, I don't agree, so I'm going to do my own version. No, there's one version of accounting, okay? Uh, same thing with engineers. The bridge will fall if you don't do the math this way. And so these are, these are systems built into the systems people that believe in principles and following a process, a system. And that's what got them there. And the teachers very often were married to a policeman 
or they were very often married to a uh, first responder of some kind or, or uh, uh, a lot of nurses uh, or PAs, uh, physician's assistants were in there. Uh, and, and so, they, again, very system-driven people. There's no creativity allowed in this. You have to follow the plan. And so when they found a financial plan, a system that they were going to do, whether it's our seven baby steps or whether it was just the steadily investing creates compound interest growth, right? Then they just did it. And they're, they're, they're marathoners. All of them, they're steady. They're steady. They're not, hee, woo, woo. There's very little creativity or art or anything in there. And if you're creative in your art, does that mean you can't get there? No, it just means you have to work with a whole different part of your brain than you work with every day because systems are what gets you there. What else really surprised you as you were doing this research? We thought that we would find because anecdotally we had run into it a bunch uh that that inheritance wasn't the primary reason that someone got to be a millionaire because that's the the great lie in the culture is that and it is an absolute lie uh the data is in okay if you don't agree with this you're just wrong okay because it's not it's like, this is the law of gravity it's truth okay so but i thought that we would find a higher percentage that inherited their money than we did and it was unbelievable. 79% inherited zero. Another 5% inherited a small amount, 5,000, 7,000 from grandmother, which mathematically does not make you a millionaire. Another 5% inherited substantial, like 250,000, after they were already millionaires. And so 79 and 5 and 5 says 89%, 90% of America's millionaires did not become millionaires because I would have guessed 70 it surprised me that it was that high that, that did not ma- become millionaires because of inherited money. Now, it's not to say they didn't get some. I told you the nuances there, but, but whew, it's mind-blowing. And that's, for me, that's a statistic that screams hope at a guy like me that's starting from nothing or starting over after losing everything. That it can, I'm so dumb, I had to do it twice, right? You know, so when someone's out there saying, well, it can't be done, as far as I'm concerned, you're stealing hope from people because you're wrong, but you're stealing hope from people that otherwise would have gone and done it because you stole their belief. And man, I get pissed off about that. I get passionate. That's just wrong. You're, you're, you're interfering in people's lives then in a negative way. And, you know, so that's one of the reasons I did the book was I kept hearing these the wealth inequality arguments and the system is broken and all the Marxist garbage that's out there and all this stuff. And it's just, it turns out it's just not true. It's just the data is in. And it, and again, you can try to argue with our research, but the methodology was very high tech, very well done. It's the world I grew up in. And so it's, yeah, we, we did it right. And we even put people looking over our shoulder to make sure it was right. It's very eye-opening. If someone comes to you and says, then, Dave, what is the surest way for me to become a millionaire? What is your answer to them? Be on a detailed plan, be in agreement with your spouse, aimed very carefully and diligently at this. Get out of debt because your most powerful wealth building tool is your income, both mathematically, spiritually, psychologically, relationally, and then steadily invest. You know, $100 a month saved at 12%. Uh, the S and P's average eleven point six, eleven point eight, depending on how many years you go back. So if you want to round down, round up. But at twelve percent, one hundred dollars a month from twenty five to sixty five is one million one hundred seventy six thousand uh, dollars. A hundred dollars, a hundred dollars. Yeah, well, it's a lot of money. I, I know, but it's 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 and a million's not what it used to be. But a hundred's not what it used to be either. So I, it's I just. It's so doable. It's so doable. And you, you said one of the things that gave you hope, you didn't grow up. I didn't grow up either. What gave me hope was my math nerdship when I started understanding the compound interest. And I went, $100? Well, God, even I could do that, you know? And that's what got me started. So we have a closing tradition. Okay. The podcast is called Erica Taught Me, but really today is all about Dave Ramsey Taught Me. No, so what it's not either. I've learned is. from you today. <laughs> so what do you want people to walk away saying, Dave Ramsey taught me this? That I can do it. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to see if there was more, but that was perfect. 
Thank you so much for doing this. I'm honored. It was a joy. You're 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 a prize. I'm now I know why you're so successful. No. <laughs> Yay! If you've enjoyed the episode, please take a moment to leave a review. It really helps support what we're doing. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next Tuesday on a brand new episode of Erica Taught Me.